Um, and, and I think we all need to sit back and think about what a tremendous asset Adrian is for this entire community. And any con that wouldn't have him would be absolutely insane. Thank you. Seats, it's open. I don't care. There's no saving seats. Please come sit down, everybody. You're nice. You're nice. This is nice. Say nice. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. So easy. Thank you. Please come sit down. I volunteer Nickerson's lap for Jay Beal. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Uh. Oh, Andy. Oh, Andy sure. Isn't that nice? Your marketing game is 100. <laughs> it's much better. It's much better than a warm can of Smirnoff ice. <laughs> I hate Trent. I really do. I really hate you. This is horrible. Hey, what? How warm is it? How warm is it? Hey, John, how warm is it? John, how warm is it? Touch it. Feel it. Caress it. How warm is warm? That's ass crack. That's good. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. That's good. All right, so we're going to kick this off. Um, so this is our panel, and really, uh, when we're coming out with the schedules, what we look at uh, for DerbyCon is, is really, you know, who can we get in here uh, that can, you know, reach a, a mass amount of audiences and talk to folks. And what I want to do is I wanted to bring a lot of folks that, that I respect um, a whole lot in this industry, um, folks that I've learned off of, that I looked up to, and I still do, um, except, no, no. <laughs> No, you are Just literally kidding. looking up to us right now. Yeah, I am looking up. Yeah. This, is this is really weird, looking down to me. Um, no, but you know, these are the folks that, you know, like HD, I know when I was getting into this industry, I remember popping Metasploit, to, uh, I think it was Framework 2 that was written in Perl at the time, and uh, you know, lo and behold, I remember uh, popping a, a SCADA infrastructure, you know, with, uh, I don't even think it was, was it Materper in Framework 2? Yeah, it was still yeah, in Framework 2, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it was um, something that, you know, I remember popping a box uh, and, and getting access to that, and I was like, the coolest thing ever, and I was, you know, in the Marines doing all this stuff, and, uh, you know, HD was one of my heroes growing up, and, you know, uh, Ed growing up in the speaking that he's done, and Nickerson, who, um, you know, had a, a TV show that he doesn't like to talk about, you know, but, uh, <laughs> Tiger Team, you guys should watch that show, and then email Chris about how much you like that show, okay? And John and everybody else that, that has really dedicated uh, their careers to this industry, um, more so not just from a career perspective, but their lives and, and what they try to do for the community. So I wanted to get them all together and uh, hopefully do some open dialogue. Um, I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be here to facilitate communications. What I'd like to do is if we could have audi audience partic participation too, if you'd like to ask any questions you want to, um, you know, what kind of underwear they're wearing, whatever's fine, it doesn't matter. It's a wide open thing here um, to, uh, to not, well, sorry. Um, but uh, it's, it's a wide open uh, dialogue here that we wanted to do and kind of talk about where we're at as far as the industry. So I'll kick it off to you guys. Guys, this is the serious faces now, serious faces. Hi. Oh, you play my, oh, get me my, get rid of my laptop. Get away from my laptop. What happened? No. Sorry, I was supposed to, no, leave my laptop alone. Oh, you guys, come on, give me this, give me this. Cord goes here, cord goes here. Mmm, so good. It's all messed up now, you guys ruined everything. There we go. All right, it's back to normal. Thank you. I don't know what happened to the power cord. All right, I'm back. I'm back to normal again. All right. So obviously, we see a lot of breaches and things like that in the media today. Um, that's a big thing that is taking over the media. Um, it's taking over what we hear from board of directors. It's taking over what we deal with on a regular basis. So I'll raise this to the panel here. Why so many breaches right now? Why so many breaches? Go ahead, Chris. 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 You. you go ahead. It's all you. It's all Chris or John. I blame Metasploit. <laughs> so, a good friend of ours, Josh Wright, has a law, and what is it, Ed? Josh Corman. Is it Josh Corman? Um, do you actually remember the quote about, yeah, I'll pass it over to Ed. So, I'm sure you guys are familiar with H.D. Moore's law. H.D., you're familiar with it, right? <laughs> the, the idea is if your security defenses are not getting better at at least the rate that Metasploit's capabilities are increasing, you will get owned. And I think this is an irrefutable law, really. So anyway, so blaming Metasploit, the thing of it is, when they do the breaches, they're not using Metasploit for a lot of them, at least the ones I'm investigating. No offense, HD. But, um, but, eight, but, but Metasploit is driving a lot of the innovation there. And the bad guys use those techniques, if not the specific tool. Just one quick 
push back on that. If you look at the client side exploits that have been added to Metasploit over the last uh, four or five years, almost every single one is based on a public sample being exploited in the wild before we got to it. So it's not that Metasploit is driving the industry, it's that the black hats are driving the industry. We're just trying to keep up at this point. So would you so, say it's the same dilemma um, of releasing the information to the public so they can protect themselves versus having the black hats have everything they want to access to in order to do it? I, I'm a big believer in disclosure. So, you know, it's one of those arguments we've been fighting for years, and I don't understand why anybody's on the other side. Um, we have to be releasing it. I, I have to play sure. the other side of that. Of I don't think more people are getting owned. I think we have more compliance and more things that give us visibility to know that we got owned. But I think the same amount of people are getting owned that they, they used to be. Yeah. Would you, say, would you say though that the industry has grown though? I mean, both yeah. on on. I mean, if you look at audiences at conferences, ten years ago we didn't have conferences like this as big as they were. You know, I mean, would you say that the industry has gotten bigger on both sides, black hat and white hat, which means that more attacks would occur or go up? I, I, I kind of disagree with that point. Um, how many of you guys are in roles that you would consider to be mixed? You're doing defense and offense for your organization. Could you guys all please raise your hands? So you look at the vast majority of people that attend these cons, they're people that are trying to do both roles. They're trying to be defenders, they're trying to understand the offense to do better, and it's very, very hard to serve both masters and get very good at both things. So. Great. So as far as, as far as pen testing goes then, what do we need to do to fix that? What do we need to do as an industry to get better at defending? Um, and how does that impact the, our industry that we're in? A lot of us are in on the pen testing field, um, or red teaming, or whatever we want to call it. Um, what's, what's our goal to get better as an industry? Sure. So, so I think an evolution, and a lot of people have been talking about this for the last couple of years, but I think we really need to get our, our game on. There's, there's a talk about, hey, it's not vulnerability assessment, it's actual pen testing. But I think beyond that, it's, uh, it's going from pen testing to actual threat emulation. Raphael Mudge has talked about it, a lot of stuff in, in you know, the, the work that he's doing, HD's work. Threat emulation, so that you can say not just, you have this vulnerability, we were able to pivot through your organization after we exploited it, and wow, that's bad news for you. But to map it to what a real world bad guy can do, that, uh, that makes it much more interesting to the business decision makers, and it'll let us uh, get the resources we need to defend our organizations. I, if I may, I, no, Ed no, is, no, no, no. no. <laughs> so Ed is absolutely correct. We have to be doing adversarial mapping. But one of the things that I've been working on for a, while, uh, a little while now, that once it's finished to a point where it's usable, we're going to release it open source, is something we're calling adversarial insight. And it's the ability not just to say, I'm this cool hacker, and I can do this, and I can do these neat attacks, but to actually quantify how well the defense is detecting you. right? We, we talk a lot about, I get in every time, I get in every time, I get in every time. That's really not an important metric. We all suck. right? The metric we really need to look at, and I hate the word metric, so ignore that I used it, but how well did they detect us? How well would they have responded if they had seen the attacks that we did, because if we're not helping them improve that, all we're doing is showing how elite we are and taking their money. That's a great point. The other thing, talking about what we can do as pen testers, because it's predominantly an offensive-based conference, right? We have the track to defend it, and that's cool, but most of us are here because we like to break things. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, the reason why I say that is because if you go outside of this industry, a lot of people say we, we hate people who write vulnerability or find vulnerabilities. We hate people who write exploits. We hate people that break into organizations because they're just breaking things. And I say that's, that's crap. Keep doing what you're doing. All structure, all architecture is based on understanding failure points. And that's what we are doing in this industry is finding those failure points. So keep finding them. Keep identifying those failure points because things are only fragile till they break. I just had a conversation in the hallway with, with some folks who work at a large uh, enterprise. And it mirrored a conversation I had about a month ago with another organization that's doing some cutting edge stuff. And it's, it's the idea that you, you have your pen testers, your red teamers, do what they do, but you set a metric of how quickly the blue team can detect them. And this one organization I was talking with a month ago said their initial metric is they wanted to be able to detect the bad guy in their presence, well, the red team, within the space of two weeks. And it was hard. They struggled for finding them within two weeks. They did. They upped their game. They got better. So this is red making blue better. And then they lowered their, their metric to one week. And then they lowered it to two days. And now they're down to about an hour and a half. But this also challenges red. 
so that red can get more innovative and impersonate or, or, or mimic or map to more sophisticated attackers. And I think this is beautiful. Red and blue working together. I, I sometimes say, I'm, I'm red. I'm offensive, you know, through and through. In fact, if you cut me, I bleed red. That's how red I am. Um, but that said, the purpose of red in this context... It's really is, weird, by the way. But it is weird, yeah. yeah. Don't, we do not need to do a live experiment with that. Thank you very Can much. Can we test it, Chris? Can we test it? <laughs> you, I know you got I'll a shank you, on man. you. I'll Chris you. always has a shank on him, so I mean... <laughs> but, but the purpose of red, never lose sight of this. The purpose of red is to make blue better. And that's a beautiful thing. Anybody else have anything to add? Make sense? I think we all agree. I mean, uh, when we can learn from each other going on the offense and having defensive folks learn from that is the best. I mean, I, I see time and time again where, you know, a company focuses on their defensive capabilities and, and the blue team just focuses on what they know in their environment. They, they don't know how attackers break in. They don't know how the offense goes after things. And I've actually found that by doing, you know, the, the whole red team, blue team piece, I learn a whole lot on the red team side because I learn how people defend better. I learned, oh, this worked. I can use this for another customer and say, hey, I've seen this work and stop us before or detect us that I haven't seen before in the past. Um, or this is something that, that made me do my technique different or change my technique different because of that. So it makes us better, which is also a win for us too. But, um, you know, it also helps us to understand what, you know, is out there, what's stopping us and what's not. And usually, I mean, I would say, would you all agree with this? 99% of the time, it's not a piece of technology. So, and that, that brings me to my next point on the technology side, which is my favorite topic. Um, What's the, why are we as an industry, I guess, focusing on um, the technology piece versus the people piece? You go into an IT organization that let's just say has 300 folks dedicated to IT and they usually have one person dedicated to security. Now, is that feasible in a company and can somebody, that one person team or a two person team or even a, f a five person team to that ratio compete and actually defend an organization? I mean, the scale of the whole premise behind IT and technology in the first place is that you can scale one person to huge organizations with not as much investment. So if we're still doing things the old ways, we'd have tons and tons of admins out there. Now we have very few numbers of admins doing using things like DevOps and large management tools and so on. And so, of course, when you start finding vulnerabilities, you find ways to either trick them or ways to abuse the technology. You get access to much more than you ever would in the past. So security being everyone's responsibility in an organization is one of the powerful ways that we as like offense-minded folks can teach the defense-minded folks or the folks who are just keeping things running. Um, I created a class uh, a few years ago when I was still at my former employer called Defend the Flag. And it was designed for like IT professionals who literally had no attack background whatsoever. Um, to come in for two days. And in the morning of the first day, they would learn host hardening stuff. And uh, in the afternoon, they would use an exploit framework like Metasploit um, to launch attacks. The next day, they took turns being blue team and red team. Because prior to that, a lot of these folks had never had exposure to even Metasploit, which sounds incredible. But how many of your IT folks who are not security focused, how many of them actually have ever run Metasploit? Yeah, you're all shaking your heads no. So just the power of teaching the defenders, you know, that in fact, understanding how easy it can be to perform offense, um, especially on those unhardened, like soft, chewy center networks that we've seen so many times, and gets them to take responsibility for the security of the entire network, knowing that there's no real perimeter. The that, you're absolutely correct. And one of the things that we've been pushing in our organization and through different presentations and things that we're doing is trying to stop this mindset that security is different, right? What I do is QA. The only difference between me when I pen test a web app and the QA person who is testing the web app is that when they find a bug, they open up a ticket and they bitch at a developer. When I find a bug, I figure out what I can do with it that's fun, right? They get upset, I giggle, right? So if we start, if, if we stop focusing on security as something that's completely separate, if we stop trying to treat it as this white tower that we have to be in because we're better than they are, and start really just accepting the fact that they can do what we do if we empower them to, we'll all be better. And in a case like that, one person can scale to defend, right? But if you don't have that buy-in, if you're not being inclusive, then you're never going to do it. It's going to fail. Yes. <laughs> yes, Mr. Nickerson, everybody.
lead person in Tiger Team to TV show on Court TV? Don't make, don't make me do it, because I will. All right, I'm done. Um, so I, well, I, I, have, I have something that I'm, I'm burning to add to that. Um, <clears throat> when Dave sent out the email asking us to be on the panel, it was this future of security thing. Right. And, and I, I took that seriously to a point of what the hell am I going to say about the future of security? Because I. That was my next question, by the way. So thanks for ruining that. No, I got you. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. We're on the same page. Yeah. Here in, in my eyes, I'm with you. Um, and, and I, I, I can talk about things now, but, but I didn't, I myself didn't have a clear idea of what I thought things were going to be like in 20 or 30 or 40 years. And in order to do that, you normally have to try and find a, a similar avenue, right? Something that we've done before that we know that we're going to apply the same basic principles. Whether we're going from point A to point Z in a train or a jet, we're still going from A to Z. Um, and I think Kevin kills it, right? It, we're, we're a quality assurance industry. That's what we do. We, we've, we've mirrored... Since 1958, we've mirrored everything that QC, QA, and test iteration does. But we're really, really slow. Like, our industry is really slow. We're really, we think we're really important. We're j They're already mad at me. We're, we're just like the QA, QC people in the 60s and 70s. We have this huge level of skill required for us to do our job. And we have to go through all of these di different iterations to make sure that the code that's produced works. So in the, in the 50s and 60s, they had to put that under control by creating rules of style in programming. They didn't even have generic standards. They just had a style. They were like, well, Fuck it, you just at least have to put paragraphs and spacing to make it look like this so that people aren't totally confused. Then from the 60s to the 70s, they started to make standardization, right? So not only is it style, but we actually have to have these basic functions. We have to call traditional sets of libraries that other people know are standard libraries, right? Then we get from the 70s to the 80s and we start actually doing testing. Burkholz makes the books called black box testing. Right? It's a software quality assurance thing that every single one of us has heard the term black box testing and most people don't even know where the hell it comes from and it's from the software QA world. So now we have a standard of how do we test things that we've never been involved in. Then you go the 80s to the 90s and we start getting automated testing. Now we have testing frameworks. From the testing frameworks, we then go into, now that we have automated testing frameworks, we have to make them smarter. Now we have to move from the QA person that understands how to code, this is the part that really hurts, from coding and machine language and everything else in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, down to, well, I kind of only need to know how to do these pieces of code because some of the automation frameworks are taking over my responsibilities. So now I need to know how to manage the bug and who the bug goes to and as well as fix the bug. But then as the framework starts to get smarter, the person who's doing the testing has to get less skilled. You don't get more skill, you don't get more money, you're gonna get less. Because now I don't have to know all that really advanced super ninja shit. All I have to do is know that when red light comes up, it's a bug and fix the bug. Well, then you get from the 90s into the 2000s. And from the 2000s on, we start to have automation. And, and automation happens where all these bugs, I don't even have to fix them anymore. I just go, hey, software, route this back to the person who created the shitty code. And it's like, cool, no problem. And you click the button, and it goes back to the Ninja Coder person. So now the QA person has almost no skill other than project management and how to use the framework. So. The reason I say all of that is because when I look at the quality assurance world and how the quality assurance world in the engineering talent went, you used to have very, very highly skilled, highly engaged, very, very technical people that had to do that stuff. Now, the people who are in the QA world at the beginning of the QA, because there's tiers, right? You have, you have the people who are still doing that. 
But there was such a limited talent pool. Ha, ha, shocking, just like us. There was such a limited talent pool that the business had to go, well, we need to automate these things. And when we automate these things, magically, we can hire somebody for 20 grand to do the job instead of 200 grand to do the job. So my idea of the future of security is that anybody who's a pen tester right now who makes 150 grand is gonna make 30 grand in the future. Quick rebuttal on that. Um, I, uh, I, I disagree somewhat. I disagree somewhat. I disagree because of the complexity of the systems that we're dealing with. We're not just dealing with code sets that we have today. We have to deal with all the code sets from yesterday. Every year progresses and the snowball of crap in your environments turns and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. Many of your environments are not getting rid of this old legacy code and we still have these vulnerabilities that exist. And it's not just the vulnerabilities and that's part of the problem. And that's one of the things associated with a, with a good pen test or a good pen testing company, a red team com uh, company, is they have the ability to go beyond just looking for standard vulnerabilities that exist. But you and I were talking before, I believe that there is a crash that's going to be coming to this industry and a lot of it has to do with what he just said. Because we're allowing this industry, as pen testers, to get completely taken over by automation tools. How many of you guys have seen tools over the past year that say, we automate a pen test? See, if you guys can be replaced by an automated tool, you will be. So this is one of the things Ed and I talk about quite a bit about pen test puppy mills who go through and automate all of these things and those things are not pen tests. Those are not red it's, teams. It's a test case. Like it is. you're making the same dying breath request that coders did in the 80s. In, in some like ways. You're, you're going, oh no, I'm important. Make sure I'm still important. Fuck you. You're not important. You know what? That's a good point. You're just not. That's a good point, Chris. Like I could replace you with a script. You absolutely could. And you know what? One of the things I didn't think of that I, you didn't talk about, but you showed up, is isn't it awesome because of all the automation and all the wonderfulness that they had in the 70s, 60s, and 80s that we now have secure code? Right. <laughs> I, it works. We need an expert. We need it someone works. who actually knows what the hell she's right. talking about. How, how many of you have actually had, okay, hands in the air pen testers, former, current, whatever. All right, keep them in, keep them in the air. Keep them in the air. Keep them up. You. Yes, you. Um, how many of you have actually had to use a zero day in a pen test in order to successfully pwn something? Had to. No other way. Okay, because of the contract doesn't count. Doesn't count. All right, very few of you had to raise your hands. So we're all talking about like, oh, it's being automated away. But actually, oh, we have bugs in the code. But actually, we we don't necessarily have like a you know a zero day problem. We have a patching problem. We have a patch deployment problem. Um, how many how many worms you know were ripping through using O days? Not too many. That's a that's a big burn for an O day. Use it on uh, as a worm. So I mean this has been going on for quite some time. So what do you think actually makes organizations care about security? Well, breaches. Money. Okay, but let's 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 look at that example, right? So yeah, only money. Yes, exactly. But what happens in a case? Does any is anyone old enough to remember who Paris Hilton is? <laughs> okay, great. So you're yeah. So remember when Paris Hilton's uh, sidekick? Do you remember that? Do you remember her sidekick? Was You're talking hacked? about the dog. The I'm not talking dog. about the dog. This has nothing to do. You know, I'm gonna let you finish, but. <laughs> so anyway, the, do the dog had nothing to do with it. Um, the point was, the demographic that bought the sidekick that was interested in Paris Hilton did not care that there was a breach and it was all over the papers. Um, they couldn't keep the sidekick 2 on the shelves after that happened. That was a classic case of security actually did not result, a big breach did not result in a loss of customers or revenue. So how do you actually get the organizations that you work for to staff you up with the resources you need, give you the tools you need, because you might actually need a few, um, and, and give you the, you know, the, the, the charter to do what you need to do. You essentially don't have to have the same goals in order for them to be aligned. Just think about your organization and what is it that you are actually trying to protect? What did they hire you to do? It wasn't to prevent breaches. Is it was to prevent loss of revenue due to security issues. So once you kind of figure that out with your business empathy networking hat of derby wonder on, 
I have not slept. Um, oh. <laughs> once you figure that out, then you'll start to actually unlock some of the resources that they have for you, and you'll get more support, and you'll get more respect, and you'll get more training, and get sent to DerbyCon over and over the cycle continues. So, you know, Chris makes a, a very thought-provoking point about the quality of software, but we can't lose sight of users screwing up, right? Mr. Chris Hadnagy, is he still around? Social engineering, right? Um, plus, just the abuse of legitimate credentials. Um, and the clever use of that to demonstrate business risk. Uh, I remember when I first started in information security, I was at Belcor. My office mate was Rich Graveman, and he was one of the head cryptographers at Belcor. He was a grumpy old man. He was wonderful. I learned so much from him. And he said to me, I was a young kid, right? I had a tie on and everything. That's how we rolled in those days. I had hair. It was beautiful. Oh All right. I got a hat. On. Nice hat. Nice hat. Exactly. So, uh, so Graveman turned to me. It's like my second day in the office, and he said, kid, don't rely on just information security. This was in 1996. He said, I'm telling you, five or ten years, they're going to figure this thing out. They're going to fix all the buffer overflows. We're going to have cryptography done right. We're going to train the users well. And your best bet is to get out of InfoSec within five or ten years. And I was like, okay, I believed it. I mean, lock and sock, that's it. That's the way it's going to be. And when Chris made his argument about the software quality stuff, it reminded me of what Rich said. And it's, I, I just don't see it going away. I think clever pen testers will continue to be, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong. I'm going to agree, I, see, I would I agree with Chris, um, because I disagreed with him. Now I'm going to agree with him. Thank you. Honey. And, and the reason why I'm going to agree with right? him, it is, but I'm debating with myself in some ways. But the reason why I agree with him is I do believe that this industry is coming down to a crash. Uh, because this industry is allowing itself to be something that is automated. You know, the, the automation that you're talking about. And it's quickly becoming something that, you know, company can say, I could hire trusted sec or, I could go hire a pen test puppy mill or buy a tool, and they do a pen test. Sure. You do a pen test. Box. You guys do a pen test. But this tool magically does a pen test, and I we're allowing that to happen. Um, and, and I believe that we're going to have a crash, but I still believe that there are going to be good firms that have been doing it right that will continue to do so. But, but I do somewhat agree with Chris. There is a crash that is going to occur. Like you said, going from 150 to 30, that, I think that may be a bit drastic, but we got to be prepared I, for it. I'm, I'm not talking about tomorrow. I mean, I'm talking about 40 years out. I'm 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 not saying we finally have hoverboards by then. Though. Will we have hoverboards, secure hoverboards by then. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm I'm sure you'll buy one in Facebook. It. I, like, I, 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 I mean, trust me. I understand how my life works. You know, but but at the same time, yeah, there's going to be good testers. But can I take that same good tester and go, hey, what did you learn in this test? And then have somebody who's a really good test building engineer and put that into the machine. Hell yeah. So at what point are you going to be John Henry versus the machine? Yeah. Right? And, and, and I feel that that realistically, we, we have to at some point accept that the, the landscape expands so fast and we don't have the talent pool to cover the landscape that we need the augmentation. Okay? We, we, we need it. It's, it, you, you can't screw everybody in the room. You have to get some Viagra. I mean, whatever, right? Like you, <laughs> you need to cheat in so order to cover the risk. Speak for yourself. <laughs> so, so, but that's <laughs> you're, you're the only one that could do it. I can't. <laughs> security take Chris's mic. Security, security take Chris's mic. You're getting old. But, but I, but I, but I think that that we need to embrace some of this automation. We need to embrace the way that that I mean, really, that HD has helped pioneer the integration of some of these things in a framework that allows rapid iteration of testing. If, if we're going to have, you know, agile programming, we need to have agile and rapid testing. And, and we can't do that. We don't have the skills, we don't have the talent pool to cover that rapid iteration of testing without using the augmentation that we have and making that augmentation better. I would agree. Isn't it awesome that we have HD Moore riding side shotgun on almost every one of our pen tests? This is fantastic, <laughs> yeah. But that's that's what I'm talking about. I, I have a I have a picture of him while I'm hacking can, every time, wait, so can, it's perfect. Can, can right, I get Steve like Moore's my homeboy, like the little the, 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 the little Jesus just kind of pointing at me, but it's just you with the thumbs up. So, uh, so unrelated to that comment, um, my view on kind of the future security and kind of where we're at, I think Chris is right in a lot of ways. 
but we're still in the middle of the high growth phase of technology adoption. So we're, we're, we can't secure things as fast as we're going to build them, and that's why we're all valuable in this room, and why we'll still be valuable. I mean, yes, we need automation. Yeah, we need to make sure that when you go on site, if you can't remember the last 35,000 CVEs, you can still do your job. That's where automation comes into play. It helps yep. you do your job better. It doesn't replace you. Because there's so much other shit out there that you need to actually audit that you can't spend time on if you're still taking around with MSO 867. So that's kind of the viewpoint of uh, you know security testing tools and security automation from my perspective. But isn't there, I mean, isn't there a fine, sorry, I'm out here, but it was a question in the audience, but isn't there a fine, sorry, I, I, I yes, <laughs> how's it going? Yeah, I'm right here, sorry. No, that's not creepy. <laughs> hi, hi, Midget Dave. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you look at companies and how they're structured, let's just take any company, any industry vertical whatsoever, they still have to have people that build airplanes, that understand aerodynamics, that understand mechanics, that understand technology and make the technology better. You can't automate everything. So there has to be a balance between that. I mean, you know, I, what, to what HG said, the automation piece of looking for all the vulnerabilities is great. That's fine. You know, we, we should have that, but that should be in the vulnerability management piece. It's not how an attacker is going to go after your company. So we have to differentiate those different groups and focus on those skill sets in this industry to keep it going. I agree to Chris's point. We, ha we have to balance the automation piece with the manual piece because there isn't enough of us. There's no, I mean, if you, we, we went through this gap, like where, InfoSec was like, hey, you know, there's a couple of people in the industry, you know, there's a few people at Lexus Park hanging out to a full-fledged industry. And so there was all these people that were experts in this industry that we, you know, basically figured out, you know, what to do. And then there was this huge gap of influx of security where we didn't have anybody that was beginning or anybody that was intermediary or anybody that was in between. So now we have this brand new industry with, with the folks that, that don't have the, the um, skill sets yet, but they will. But we still have to use that automation piece to augment at that point in time. So I agree with kind of both of those. So, in terms of automation uh, and and the the fact that there are there's a there's a dearth of new talent coming in to the uh, to the field. Yeah, I said dearth in the morning. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I think that I think that uh, sharpening the tool not just not just talking about like fuzzers, but the fuzzer will only find the crash. The artist is the one who finds whether or not that crash is exploitable. If we can sharpen the tools that that enable that artistry, that's a great analogy. that step, that's, great. Um, that's something that can close a skills gap that we desperately need on the defense side. So tools are great, but it's where exactly in the you know in the vulnerability and exploitability discovery do you, can the tools be most effective? And and then you get back to this idea of evolving from pen testing to threat emulation so that you can provide additional business value to them. You can automate a lot, and you should automate wherever you can, but posing as with a mindset of an adversary for the organization, that I don't think you'll be able to automate, at least in the near-term future, until we get AI. Um, so bring that down to the next level. I got one thing real quick. Real quick, we got a member from the audience that wants to say something here. So, Yeah, I raised your hand, my hand before you mentioned fuzzers, so I think it's kind of cool you brought that up. But uh, Chris just shared a really great article about Taviso finding a bunch of vulnerabilities in Kapersky using a fuzzer. So you see, you know, some of the best people in Google, uh, Project Zero and things like that, you know, they're increasingly automating. And so, you know, if people like that have to do it, don't, wouldn't you expect a lot of people to kind of follow that example? So one of the, one of the illustrious members of Project Zero is a man by the name of James Forshaw. And um, he used to work for a small consultancy out of the UK. And I know James pretty well because I wrote him a check for $100,000 um, this one time at Blue Hat. And for what? For what, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Um, it was to, it was, it's not going to get weird. Okay, it's already weird. Um, <laughs> No, I wrote him a check for $100,000 because he found a new mitigation bypass for the latest at the time version of Windows, um, fully patched, et cetera. So he, he came up with a new attack technique, essentially. Um, and that was rare enough, and that program is still ongoing and paying out hundred grand for new exploitation techniques on the latest version of Windows. But the point that you were saying about they use fuzzers, they're using automation, James does not. James does not, and a lot of the best artists in this industry, and yes, you are freaking rock stars, yes, uh, do not use fuzzers. They are, they are Neo, and they see the lady in the red dress, and that is how they do it. Um, literally, when I fed him enough beers to get him to agree to enter this particular bounty program that I started at Microsoft, I said to him, I was like, no, look, I know you can do this, and he's like, 
well, I've never looked at IEB. Oh, it's a terrible accent. Anyway, he's like, I've never, I've never really looked outside of .NET. I've only been looking at .NET Framework. And I was like, I believe in you. Have a beer, you know. And so he got permission from his employer. Took him three weeks, three weeks of staring at that lady until that red dress appeared. And he wrote up the exploit that fully bypassed ASLR and DEP, all the other mitigations on the platform. He wrote a beautiful white paper, and I wrote him a check for $100,000, no fuzzers involved. Well, I, I have a question. Um, once you wrote him a check for $100,000, did his innovative attack thing become something that you needed him for again? Well, I mean, didn't you, didn't you automate him after that? Uh, no. So... The issue... Um, you needed his brain every single time that that vulnerability came up? No, or so it wasn't... Or you put it into the framework to make sure that, like, oh, we don't do shit like that anymore, and automate him out? No, so the problem is, it, you know, essentially a mitigation bypass requires, like, architectural changes to the operating system that will take time to implement, roll out, and not break everything, you know, that has ever run before or will again in the future. So there are still unmitigated Yeah, it's portions. like build from source versus make clean, right? Make clean means it has bugs. Yeah, okay. So that's not what we're talking about here, but what I'm saying is the fact is not only did he identify these new attack techniques, not only are there still unmitigated parts of it, but variations could be discovered, maybe have been discovered by people in this room already, and it would be great if, yes, he kept looking for that woman in the red dress, uh and yes, he is a unique talent, as uh, many of those people are, and that's why I call Pwn to Own Exploit Art Walk, you know, because I, these are the artists. But look how incredibly complex it's gotten over the years, Chris. I mean, you look at traditional buffer overflows versus what we have to do today in order to get remote code execution. I mean, it's, it's insane. But that takes a person manually to do that, to Agreed. research that and go after it. So but you once, can't automate some, everything. once one person figures it out, right? don't they become automated after that? Sort of. Well, look at like AFL, right? Like Zalewski's my hero, and AFL, like I need AFL tattered to my chest at this point because he's killed more bugs than any human on this planet. Just I got an HD more tattoo on my back, so it's fine either way. <laughs> it was a little lower, actually. <laughs> Tramp stamp. It's the small. It's the small of the back. It is it's right, right there. Sorry, dude. <laughs> um, but if you look at like the the class of the bugs that AFL kills, like it, it actually, arguably, you're better off building fuzzing tools and doing vulnerable research a lot of times, but at the same time, you have to have some manually go find those initial areas to start building the fuzzer around. So there's there's both pieces to it. Yeah. Well, and, and also, it's kind of getting back to the point about they found the bug, they automated it, we don't need him anymore, or we do need him anymore. I, I think that that's kind of a moot point, because all structural engineering is an understanding of failure points. Every single truss has a failure point, every single two-by-four has a failure point, the doors have failure points, and they record those failure points. And just because we can automate that, we still have structural engineers that understand those failure points, and they research those failure points, and they still great, create great architectures. So moving forward, I believe that pen testing is going to be like the structural engineers for architecture of IT systems. We know the failure points, we understand where those failure points are, and we can develop mitigation. So if one truss, one computer collapses or fails, it doesn't lead to a total catastrophic failure of the architecture. Right, so I wanted to, like, 10 minutes ago, uh, make this comment when Chris was going on about uh, um, you know, automating people. I don't think it's necessarily a problem because if you can, you know, as you say, there's a limited talent pool. If you can use automation to free up from the, you know, the piddle and crap, you know, for compliance reasons, you know, that you need the checkbox. Oh, we had a, you know, you're saying you could hire trusted sec or, you know, uh, uh, somebody from Puppy Miller, a tool. Well, I think part of the problem is that yeah, you're saying, well, are those all equivalent pen tests? No, they aren't. Right. There are places that, you know, we need a pen test, you know, for this checkbox. They're going to go with the, the puppy mill or the, the cheap-ass tool. But, you know, th there's reasons that they would do that, but they also need to understand, no, they're not getting the same thing. You, you know, if you want to push the envelope and stuff like that, you need, you know, the, uh, the human factor and everything involved. So I would love to see if there was like an entry level position of you know like you know security monkey that just runs the tool, but where a business also understands you still need to have you know, augment that with you know your your rock star your you know so there's between having a house painter and an artist kind of thing you know, both work with the same thing but one is 
so much more than the other. Right. Um, this is something I think that is a, a gap in how we're discussing it up here, is that when we say, I had a pen test done, that is such a huge variety of things. As somebody who has looked at way too many pen test results from lots of different companies, I will tell you that the results you get from Black Hills or, or whoever it is way different than the result you get from that company over there. Not going to name any names. Trusted sec. But <laughs> so, but the problem is we treat those the same. And I think, and I know this is going to be a horrible thing to say, PCI did something right just recently. Right? They said you have to follow some execution standard, one we may know about, <laughs> right? If you're not following this standard, this is something I've talked about for years. I've, I've thrown out the idea of regulation, certification, some type of way to say, I know what I'm doing and I'm at this level, whatever that level happens to be. And then the, the people who just want the checkbox, the idiots, right? They can go get the checkbox, but everybody will know it's just a checkbox. And this is, John Strand said this years ago, I agreed with it 100% then, I agree with it 200% now. Every single one of our report standards should be public. If any pen tester says to you, I can't show you one of my reports, you need to punch him in the throat and kick him out of your building, right? Throat punches, absolutely, or her, whatever, right? Like, whatever it is, we need to set people like that on fire, right? <laughs> well, part... At the Hyatt. <laughs> so, so I don't think that we've got, I don't think that we have, I don't think they're idiots Hello? Hello? for... Where's that coming from? Oh, it's Jay. Oh, ah, hi. <laughs> um, I don't think they're idiots for choosing, I don't think people are idiots for choosing that low end pen, that low end pen test. I think they're, they're, I think it's an uneducated market. And we will educate them, we will talk about the differences between pen tests. But let me say, if we ever get to that, to that horror story, and for me it's a horror story at least, that, that Chris is describing, um, where everyone says, okay, this is a, this is a John Henry thing. John Henry was a nice linear race. Who can get to the end? It's that simple mission. If it ever looks like that simple mission, who can get to the end of a pen test first, the computer or the human, um, and they've got different billable rates and so on. I, I think like, and our whole industry just collapses. We have no pen testers left. Or we've got a tiny number of pen testers who make less than the receptionists. I think if we get to that point, the black hats are going to do the education for us because you'll have all of these companies that got pen tests, that all checked their box, that all had the automated pen test, got the very best tool, can point to that tool. Heck, as long as you're using the tool, you probably got the logo on your website. And the black hats will just run over them and will have wonderfully great results. I mean, wonderfully horrible results. So, all right. But so, that's where we go. It's education. Someone will do it for us if we can't do it. So you're talking about undereducated market. Could you could you perhaps be talking about people who are like there's a there's an S at the end of the HTTP. There's a, we're fine. Yeah, there's a lock. There's an S. We're it good. Said yeah, it said secure. There was a it was green. You know, all of these things, right? That we've we've essentially like dumbed it down, trained them up to to think that that's it, right? And um, I mean, as uh. As an old pen tester, I can tell you, with my advanced age, um, back w at the beginning of, of application and penetration testing, it was a matter of that same education point. And attacks and breaches are getting more numerous. I don't think they're picking up on the lesson, is what I'm saying. I mean, this has been, like, literally, I, I was pen testing 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm that old. So anyway, um, the, but th that was this was the lesson that we were trying to shout from the rooftops. One, you'll never be 100% secure. A determined adversary will be able to penetrate your network no matter what. Two, that little lock doesn't mean anything. The little S at the end, yeah, that's lovely, but that has nothing to do with application layer vulnerabilities. Try harder. Three, you know, all of the tools and all of the pen tests that you do and all of the QA that we do, you're never going to find all of the bugs. 
And so with all of this, I'm, I'm wondering why we're even worried about tools and automation taking our jobs. And, uh, and even if, even if the tools and automation could potentially commoditize our work, you know, and, and down level our pay grades and whatnot, a tool can't actually do true risk assessment, can't empathize with the business of what I was saying earlier, figure out what it is that the business cares about. The tool is not going to be able to tell them, you know, that the sky falling here is going to cost you this. Katie's trying awfully hard to convince us that she's old enough to drink. <laughs> I just don't believe it. So one quick note on this. I mean, if you look at, um, if you look at pen testers in general and, and most tests, um, we're inherently lazy. Trend. We're going to use, we're going to basically take the lowest hanging fruit, use that to get in. So the idea behind automation is to take away those low hanging fruits. So when you actually have a real pen test done, somebody's trying to emulate an attacker, they don't just walk in and use the same thing that, you know, anyone would do in five seconds. So that's the goal of automation is not to, for internal organizations who have automated pen tests, the idea is to, uh, get those, fix the things that someone else would just, you know, basically breeze through in their next pen test, make them work for it a little bit more. So, you know, you asked a question about what the future entails, kind of going on that. We Hold on, PCI. ice medic, ice medic, ice She's, medic. It's not iced, it's, it's warm. Yeah, I need a medic, where is that device? Contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Where's, where's the device to make See, it cold? The ice medics are a failure. Ice medic. It is, it is actually worse, cold. Um, I, at room temperature, it goes down your throat much I rescind, smoother. I rescind my call for an ice medic. So... So, you know, we're talking about PCI 3.0 and, you know, HD scooted away from Kevin and like, he was like, but no, I agree with PCI 3.0 basically defining and, and going very clearly and saying, this is not a freaking pen test. This is what you have to do. I think that helps. But what's going to drive the industry in the next five years far more than PCI or anything else is insurance companies who are going to refuse to pay out premiums yep. whenever companies get hacked if they it's got already a crap pen test. It's yep, already, it's already started. And on the PCI front, I mean, what I also liked about it, not to get into compliance, but they also define, like, you don't, you're not testing anymore from the cardholder data environment. You're testing from anything that could impact the cardholder data environment, which is the most, Logical. the best thing that you could have ever met. And, and how many of us in the pen testing field now go into, um, you know, companies that want their PCI 3 assessment? Like, hey, so here's our defined list of what you can attack. We're like, uh-uh. No. That's not that's not what it says anymore. You We but, can do anything we want to to get access to that environment. That's part Dave. of the scope. Last year, we only spent $5,000 for our pen test, and it was just these two servers. Yeah. Anything that supports your infrastructure that can impact the CD environment is now in scope, which is a great thing for PCI. I, I mean, everybody hates it on the company side now. Everybody's complaining about it. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's great to see that they actually made some changes and definitions to the pen test field. I mean, it's showing the maturity that we're getting to. I think not on the not on the mission side because we're, we're you know we're not we're not going to go to Skynet yet not in forty not to forty years. Chris said forty years, okay. Forty years. So in forty years. I'm not saying people aren't important. Derby Chris Chris doesn't like people anymore. So. Derbycon forty five. Forty five. Derbycon forty five. There's going to be robots here. <laughs> I'll fly back from Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. You're going to the Tiger Team two TV show is going to be on the air then. Yeah, All team. robots three. Yeah. Tiger Team Triple Tiger in two Triple seconds. Tiger. Triple Tiger. Triple Tiger. Dave will be on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great stuff. Um, something that Ed touched on earlier, and I think this is where pen testers will always have a job. If I might quote, um, or be the first one to quote Mr. Robot, one of the things that he says during that series, it's just outstanding, is he says, I hack people. And that's how bad guys get in organizations nowadays, a lot of it. We, we know that. We know it's about social engineering. We know it's about getting people to do something that they would not normally do. And that takes research that only humans can do. It's not something that I, th I think you can automate. And so that, that part of it, at least, seems to be something that will always be a part of the pen testers' uh, work in terms of getting inside of organizations. Any thoughts on that? Well, first of all, did anybody see that uh, set was on Mr. Robot? Heck yeah. Huh? Hack and set. That was an old version, and that, that thing that they actually used wasn't even in set anymore, but it's still cool. Um, but no. <laughs> what do you guys think on the human piece? Are, aren't you the automation piece of social engineering? Like, Crap. You personally? <laughs> why do you, you got to call that out, dude? I mean, we're friends. No. <laughs> So as our industry matures and security companies merge and IPO, how do we make sure we do our own quality control 
and make sure that we're doing good assessments and, and pen testing. Essentially, if you come across a scope that you know shouldn't be done in a week, but they just sold it as a week, and you're doing, say, a PCI-3, and you know, you may be able to get in in a week, but say it may take you two weeks. How do we quality control that? How do we prevent the puppy mills from driving the industry and really um, having quality testing? Just quick feedback on that was we have I've got a customer who got in trouble recently because they would not certify PCI because of the same issue. They they basically weren't getting paid for the time. They said you got one week, really small scope, and we want you to certify. Went all the way up to the board of directors of the company that they're at, and they held their ground. And it took like six months to resolve, but they held their ground all the way through, and eventually the company bought into it, made the remediation they needed to do, and got there. But it wasn't fun for anybody. Um, it's, that's really, really hard. And if you're a small company with a lot of resources and you're working for much bigger companies, like, you know, good luck. It's, it's really tough. I, I do think it's completely valid to write in your report the limitations that were placed on you, including time-based limitations, while you're doing the test. I mean, because y- your job is to properly, as best you can in the resources you're given, to represent the risk of that organization. And part of that risk is you weren't able to look deep enough. And you should tell them that. The other thing to keep in mind it, it, for you, you shouldn't care if it qualifies for PCI 3, right? It's not your responsibility to ensure that they do the right thing at that point. That's assuming you fought that battle all the way up to the point where you signed the contract. And in my opinion, you probably shouldn't have signed I, that contract. I'm, I'm, I'm on your team for this because I've been on the other side for a really fucking long time. And I've had to have the same conversation. It sucks. And, and, and the releasing your own accountability, if you have any bit of pride in what you do for a living is wicked hard and you just end up not doing it. Right. Right. You end up going through the test and giving them a hundred hours when you have 40 on the books yep. yeah. because you actually have pride in your work. And it's a hard thing to get but, through. No, 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 no. I, I think I'm going to give you a piece of advice on on that. I'm with you. If you push back, I have found with the vast majority of our customers, and I, and I think that we're extremely lucky because of being associated with Security Weekly and all the things that we do, that our customers know kind of what they're getting in into before we actually do a test. If you push back and it goes to the customer, I have found nine times out of ten, the customer will come back and say, "I want this done right," yeah. and they will give you the the additional time to do it. Right. And that's so why you just have to push back, and if they continue to push you. And as Ed said, document it and move on. Or, see, what I was saying was, you absolutely should push back. You absolutely should say, that's not enough. Oh, I'm sorry. It's weird I'm doing this. Yeah, I know. Please don't do that, tug toner. But, um, so, what I'm saying is, you should push back. You should say that's not enough. And if they don't come back and say, okay, we'll give you more time, walk away. You're right. If you do get into the contract, document it. But you can't. I can't hear you without a mic. You're going to have to shout it out. You're shaking your head. Go work, I don't, for, an, go work for another company. Yeah, exactly. I will come, tell you come that... Come work from us. We walk away from jobs all the time. Yes. In the middle of the job, I will stand Absolutely. up and be like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You're not cool. I'm out. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Hey. You don't want my help? Fuck off. Go, go to fucking Acubon or whatever they are now. And, They'll take your money. And now it's on the table, isn't it? <laughs> no, but that does get to a point. And I know that a lot of you guys are working for pen test puppy mills and it sucks. And all joking aside, the people that want to do quality work, the companies that are up here, we would take every single one of you if we could. Just stick to your guns, do the best you possibly can, and look for an exit. Uh, just, Just... Know that we, we know that it's a problem and constantly be looking for another company. That's the only thing I can recommend. Dave will hire you. He's growing. <laughs> well, and one, and one note from, from possibly the oldest person on this panel, um, myself, is, uh, is that this has happened before. I was in the first batch of QSAs ever. Sorry. Anyway, uh, for any of you, by the way, who are my victims, um, just, there, I've gotten phone calls because I would leave my real phone number in the in the databases that I would pop, and uh, I'd leave I'd leave uh, my username as um, I didn't know it, Dave, but it was an homage to you, Herschel Krastovsky. If you find 
Herschel Kristofsky um, in any of your pen test engagements. Uh, that might have been me with a 415 area code That's phone number. That's a horrible way to get a date. <laughs> you know you're right. But you were young. Thank right? God. Um, no, but uh, the point is, this has happened before. The commoditization and you know uh, the the desire to get commodity type pen tests that are underscoped, underpaid, all of that stuff, and the market will eventually keep correcting itself. And this is what they're all telling you. And I can tell you from that ancient time period of you know ten or more years ago um, that this is this is absolutely something that will continue. So do find other opportunities at places where you feel like your skills are being applied the way that you want them to grow and show. So my question is, I don't know if it's really a question, but um, so we've noticed lately that breaches and stuff that the attackers are staying in the networks longer. They're sitting there and they're watching and they're waiting and they're slowly exfiltrating stuff and creating persistence. Do you think that automation tools will soon be able to do that since we're talking on the human automation standpoint that like that's something that is an artist and a human sitting there watching and waiting and knowing how the blue team's reacting and that kind of stuff? Absolutely. If you look at the current trend of pen test tools out there, if you look at things like the puppy stuff released a couple days ago, if you look at the stuff that uh, Raphael's doing with Cobalt Strike 3, all, I mean, I don't want to talk about all the competitors, but basically if you look at both the open source and commercial space, everyone's working towards those goals of building persistent testing frameworks, both open source and commercial. So that's where the trends are going today. Now what do you think about security products that have massive, massive security exposures in them that are supposed to be protecting the network, um, i.e. <laughs> i.e. running your web server as root, or i.e. writing I, your application in PHP? Anyway, sorry, go ahead. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All security software is secure. Yeah, I don't computer, That's security bro. security <laughs> software. It's in, it's in the title. I mean, aren't we supposed to have, like, you know, like, security practices that we follow as security people writing secure code? Like, I mean, aren't we supposed to, like, hey, we probably shouldn't have crappy code getting introduced into customer environments when it's supposed to protect their environment? We, we shouldn't be running our, our web servers as roots. We shouldn't be... You know, I think that's like a 1985 thing, right? I mean, that's like like isn't old school that, Linux thing, right there, right? Isn't isn't that what our mother told all of us, right? Like, do as I say, not as I do, yeah. right? And don't we all have to follow that kind of constantly? Like, yeah, sure. I don't have a password on my phone, but like, I teach you how to secure your enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing sadder than us uh, adding Metasploit modules for Metasploit into Metasploit. So. <laughs> That's so much. Is time slower on the inside? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, is that, yeah, is that meta, meta. So meta. Um, I got an idea. How about book bounties? <laughs> <laughs> this is well, the last topic of the day because I think it's really important here. We're uh, running out of time. But I mean, where have bug bounties gone inside of? And by the way, are bug bounties and pen testing competing? Some people are trying to make them compete, but in fact, you you can't actually just operate with pure bug bounties alone. I say this from a company that does bug bounties. Yeah, enables bug bounties. Um, the fact of the matter is, like, the you will always need decent pen testers. You'll ideally get great pen testers, but you'll always need decent pen testers. Um, and you're not necessarily going to expose the same kinds of transparency. You're not going to you're not necessarily going to do white box bug bounties on unreleased code. Um, you're not necessarily going to have people who are going to be, um, you know, file format aware uh, of your, you know, for your parsers and all that stuff in a bug bounty situation. So it is that QA augmentation and potentially some commoditization of finding zero days in your own, you know, applications um, and whatnot for which there aren't a lot of eyes. But absolutely, you will you will still need pen testing always. I would say from a bug bounty side, um, the ability to detect and have folks that focus on your code to identify flaws is a massive asset to our industry. And uh, I mean, from a, from a pen testing perspective, it's, they're completely different goals. And, and, and I mean, you know, what we're looking for are ways in that an adversary may go in and attack and compromise, and from there cause damage to the organization. Whereas, you know, we're looking for defects in applications, defects in different environments in the areas to go and track and fix. I think they're completely different goals, but something that's to the same goal of making sure that security is done in a good way. So I completely agree with both of those as well. So, agree? Yes. Yes? Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the panel. Let's give a round of applause for everybody here.
and thank you for the audience participation in the questions. It was wonderful. These folks actually sound like they know what they're talking about. It's really weird, but um, no, we appreciate everybody coming out here. Uh, that's the end of DerbyCon. Uh, everybody have a good night. No, just kidding. Um, we're gonna do a quick lunch break, um, and so uh, they're, they're, we're gonna be breaking these rooms down um, into individual rooms. So this will be track two, track one will be there, track three will be there, and there's a lot of other tracks around the place. So get familiar. We're gonna be opening up the vendor uh, vendor areas, all the lockpick villages, all that stuff's now going on. So welcome to DerbyCon. We'll see you soon.